Hey, my name is Nathaniel Fawson. I'm an archaeologist. I have been for 10 years, and this channel is dedicated to the archaeology of North America's eastern woodlands in the time period before colonization. The, today's video is going to be a bit different because Ancient Americas is joining us. Hello, I'm Ancient Americas, and I'm thrilled to be here today. I said back in my fourth video ever that I would handle this topic eventually, and it's about time that I got around to it. So we're going to be talking today about the Salutrian Hypothesis, which is an idea that causes more archaeological flame wars than pretty much anything else within the discipline. The Salutrian Hypothesis was first proposed by Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian Institution and Bruce Bradley of the University of Exeter. In 2002, they published their first paper that proposed an idea that hadn't been taken seriously since the 1960s, that certain similarities between the North American Clovis culture and the Western European Salutrian culture suggested that the Clovis people were really the descendants of a pioneering group of Salutrians from Western Europe, who traveled by boat across the Northern Atlantic to the Americas. Soon after, the Salutrian hypothesis exploded in popularity in news media and on the internet. This wasn't only a phenomenon in the press. In one of my first archaeology classes as an undergraduate student, the Salutrian hypothesis was taught as a possible alternative to the more traditional hypothesis that indigenous peoples of the Americas had come from Siberia, either through an ice-free corridor or along a Pacific coastal route. It was an idea that we were taught to take seriously as scientists. By 2012, Bradley and Stanford were ready to present their hypothesis in a full book detailing their evidence. This book, Across Atlantic Ice. It was strange in 2012, and is even stranger now, but this book still talked about the Clovis complex as though it was the product of relatively recent settlers to the Americas, starting around 13,000 years ago and ending somewhere around 12,600 years ago. Clovis was the oldest toolmaking tradition that archaeology could identify without needing a carbon date for verification because of how distinctive the Clovis fluted biface is. Eastern pre-Clovis technology, like what we see at Cactus Hill and the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, doesn't have features that are visibly diagnostic. But even when this book was written, we knew there were pre-Clovis components at several sites in the eastern woodlands. Stanford and Bradley framed their hypothesis as a solution to an archaeological problem. Put simply, they observed that Clovis technology should have derived from some earlier technology that looked similar to Clovis, just as the subsequent Folsom technology derived from Clovis. A few of the hallmark features of the technological ancestor to Clovis should include things like large biface tools, large prismatic blade production, very thin bifacial spears, and knives made with extensive overshot flaking, as well as bone or ivory tools. If all that sounds very technical, that's because it is. I'll let Nathaniel explain since he's much more experienced than me in lithics. In the study of stone tools, a central focus is the bifacial tool. Bifaces are chipped out of silica-rich stone, like chert, rhyolite, and obsidian. They're flat and come to an edge all the way around with flake scars on either side produced by the reduction process. An overshot flake is one that leaves behind a wide scar across the face of the biface and goes all the way across the center of the piece, almost to, or slightly past, the opposite edge. It removes a lot of material at once, but an improper execution can destroy the tool, ripping off the cutting edge on the other side. When executed correctly, overshot flaking produces very wide and thin bifaces that are very effective projectile weapons. By contrast, a blade is a long, thin, and ideally flat flake with a razor-sharp cutting surface around the edges. Large blade tools are associated with the broader Clovis toolkit, but they fall out of fashion and reappear sporadically in the archaic and woodland periods. If Clovis technology was invented by relatively recent migrants from Siberia or Alaska, then those technologies from around 18,000 to 15,000 years ago should have some or most of these features. However, the technology in Beringia just before Clovis is characterized by microlithic technology. These are very small flake tools glued into wood or bone handles. They have almost nothing in common with Clovis. This incongruity between Clovis technology and the microlithic tradition from the purported ancestral homeland of Clovis never made much sense. And more recent work has shown that the sites with the earliest Clovis dates are found further south and east, with a pattern expanding north and west over time. It moves in the wrong direction. 
Stanford and Bradley's solution to this problem is what archaeologists call the Salutrian Hypothesis. They argue that the ancestors of the Clovis culture did not come from Beringia. Instead, an earlier group of people from the Salutrian culture traveled by boat from Western Europe across the Atlantic. At this time, the northern part of the ocean was covered in sea ice that marine mammals like seals lived on. These Salutrian ancestors hunted these animals farther and farther out to sea until they reached the shores of North America, somewhere around modern-day Maryland. The Salutrian stone and bone toolkits they brought with them were ancestral to the pre-Clovis and Clovis technologies seen in the eastern woodlands between about 16,000 and 12,600 years ago. Similar to how Caribbean barbacoa forms the technological ancestor to Rodney Scott's South Carolina barbecue. So what are these similarities that Bradley and Stanford were seeing? It isn't just that Clovis and Salutrian toolkits included large bifaces that were often manufactured with the overshot technique. At Paleo-American sites like the Anzic site in Montana, archaeologists recovered beveled bone rods that are shaped and beveled the same way as Salutrian bone rods, and both are believed to have worked as projectile weapons. Both cultures have produced similar bone artifacts that have the same zigzag pattern carved into the base. Coincidence? Clovis people had a practice of burying caches in strategic locations as they moved into the southwest and up the Rockies. These caches are frequently filled with extra-large Clovis bifaces made from chert that came from a long distance away, sometimes hundreds of miles away. Occasionally, other objects were included in the caches. The Anzic cache included 10 cores for making flake tools, 55 early-stage Clovis preforms, 5 late-stage Clovis preforms, 8 complete Clovis points, and 6 of those polished bone rods I talked about before. All this was covered in red ochre, which is a mineral commonly associated with burials and cave paintings all over the world. At least one Salutrian cache has also been identified, called the Volgu cache. This was a collection of at least 15 Salutrian laurel leaf bifaces made with banded Turonian flint from over 100 miles to the northwest. The bifaces themselves are all much longer and whiter than the average laurel leaf, but are proportionally thinner. They're extreme works of craftsmanship. The Kinmar biface is the only known example of a laurel leaf shaped biface made of material from the American side of the Atlantic that may have been made with the overshot technique. This was dredged up by a scallop harvesting boat off the coast of Virginia. It came up with some mastodon bones dated to about 23,000 years ago, which is often presented as evidence that the point itself is from the Pleistocene. Both technologies also happen to include hide scraping tools made from large and especially long blade flakes. The culture that descends from Salutrian built structures that had impressed pebble flooring, and there is at least one Clovis structure at the Galt site in Texas with a similar square pebbled floor. To be perfectly honest, for two groups of people like Clovis and Salutrian to independently develop this specific set of toolmaking practices and toolkits on two different continents should not be a coincidence. The chances of that happening are astronomical. Both share quirks and idiosyncrasies that are extremely rare among stone toolmaking cultures. Bradley and Stanford say explicitly that this is a hypothesis, and it should only be taken seriously if it is tested scientifically and holds up to scrutiny. There are two basic components for us to test. First, if a group of people ancestral to the Clovis culture migrated to America from Europe, there should be a genetic signature in America, probably concentrated in the eastern woodlands that descends from hunter-gatherers in Western Europe from somewhere between 25,000 to 18,000 years calibrated BP. And second, pre-Clovis technology should be more similar to Salutrian and to Clovis than Salutrian and Clovis are similar to each other. According to Bradley and Stanford, the technological traits expected are expressed in Salutrian technology, and the pre-Clovis sites at Meadowcroft, Page Ladson, and Cactus Hill provide the missing link between the two. Moving forward, it's important to keep in mind that we're not questioning whether or not Salutrian people could have taken boats across the Atlantic. I'm certain that they could have if given the time and motivation to do so, but archaeology is not about what could have happened. 
we want to know what did happen. The first thing we need to assess is the genetic question. Up front, I want to make it extremely clear that the Salutrians lived in Europe, but they were not people who we would consider to be Europeans in an ethnic, genetic, or cultural sense. Generally speaking, the people who are considered ethnically European today are the result of at least three major waves of migration. The early hunter-gatherer groups of Eurasia, followed by the first farmers from Anatolia into Europe starting around 10,000 years ago, and finally, the movement of Bronze Age pastoralists from the Eurasian steppe something like 4,000 years ago. The Salutrians lived more than 10,000 years before that combination of ancestries existed. The Salutrian hypothesis has been accused of having Eurocentric or white supremacist implications, but I think it's pretty clear that that is not the case with Stanford and Bradley's work. What people on the internet have done with their research is another story altogether. With that out of the way, I'll turn things over to Ancient Americas. Thanks, Nathaniel. Genetics has become a very important field in understanding the movement of human populations. By comparing the DNA of modern human populations with DNA recovered from ancient humans, scientists can piece together the movement and development of their descendants. This has shed a lot of important light on our understanding of human migration and settlement in the Americas. If the Salutrian model is correct, people from Western Europe should have arrived in the Americas between 18,000 to 15,000 years ago. Assuming that any of them survived and passed on their genes to modern Native American descendants, there should be detectable genetic traces in ancient and modern humans. I do want to mention a quick caveat, and that is that when we look at indigenous North American genetic evidence, both modern and ancient, we are looking at small sample sizes that are probably not giving us a complete picture. It goes without saying that our understanding could change at any time with a new discovery. So with that out of the way, does the current genetic evidence show any ancient lineages that could have derived from a European source? Some proponents of the Salutrian hypothesis have pointed to the presence of haplogroup X as a link between North American indigenous groups and peoples living in Europe. A haplogroup is a group of people that share specific genes that are derived from a common ancestor. Haplogroup X is found in indigenous North American populations and in modern European and North African populations. At first glance, this looks very compelling, and it's tempting to trace an imaginary line between North America and Europe and speculate that there was a migration. However, the genetic picture is actually more complicated, what many fail to realize is that the populations in Europe and North America belong to different clades or subgroups of haplogroup X. Europeans with haplogroup X lineage are in the X2b, X2d, and X2c clades, while Native Americans with haplogroup X lineage are in the X2a and X2g clades. This is important because geneticists can see that those lineages in America do not descend from the lineages in Europe. Actually, neither of them are derivative from the other. A good way to think of this connection is as a cousin relationship rather than a parent-child relationship. These X2 clades all appear to have a common ancestor in Eurasia long ago, but where and when this split occurred is still not known for sure. Although no known lineage ancestral to X2a has yet been identified, an interesting hint may come from the remains of a Botai boy from the Altai Mountains. His DNA was sequenced and found to have been part of the X haplogroup, but these remains are only 9,000 years old, and there's no way to prove that those populations were there any earlier. The oldest known remains in North America with the X haplogroup come from the Kennewick Man in Washington State, all the way on the other side of the continent, and his genetics show no European ancestry. So what do current genetic studies say about the origins of Native Americans? Currently, the consensus is that the ancestors of Native Americans descended from northern Siberian and East Asian populations approximately 25,000 years ago. For thousands of years, this new ancestral population was isolated and developed several distinct genetic traits that they would pass to modern indigenous Americans. Sometime about 16,000 to 13,000 years ago, that population began to grow and diversify rapidly, and this is likely due to the fact that they had moved into the Americas and were spreading out across the continent. The data available shows that indigenous peoples are genetically descended from Asian populations. 
This leaves us with two scenarios to reconcile the available data with the Salutrian hypothesis. The first is that Salutrians came to the eastern woodlands and were the first humans to arrive there. In this scenario, they would have spread out and grown until they met the ancestors of modern Native Americans who replaced them but also adopted their Salutrian technology. This is possible. There are documented examples of genetic populations dying out and leaving no living descendants, but it's not very likely. Clovis populations appear to have been fairly high to leave such a massive archaeological footprint in under 800 years and their descendants, like the Folsom and Dalton cultures, are also very prolific. The second scenario would involve the Salutrians arriving in an already populated land, where they encountered the inhabitants, passed on their technology, but did not produce any surviving offspring with them. Again, this is possible, but very unlikely. So now we have to evaluate if the material culture of the Salutrians was actually ancestral to pre-Clovis and eventually Clovis itself. What about all of those similarities between the two material cultures? First and foremost, we have to check out the bifaces themselves. Then we'll talk about how they were made. Two main types of Salutrian bifaces are presented as comparable to later Paleo-American bifaces. These are the laurel leaf types and the indented base types. Indented base points have a very similar outline to Clovis points, but most of them aren't actually bifaces. Instead, they're made by retouching a prismatic blade into a Clovis-ish outline. The ones that are bifaces tend to be much more heavily worked on one side than the other, so you get these big unworked areas on a single side. From what I've seen of these, they're made much more like the more common specimens of post-Clovis Dalton points than Clovis or even pre-Clovis triangulars. Laurel leaf types look like this. They're pointed on either end, but one end is wider than the other. These are very thin and tend to be on the larger end of the spear slash knife category. They don't look like anything from the Clovis technological tradition, but they have an important manufacturing feature that they share with Clovis overshot flaking. An overshot is a wide flake that is struck off of one edge of a biface and removes material all the way across to the other edge. This seems counterproductive. You're removing from the cutting edge. But if you start out with a really wide preform, it can be an effective way to thin a biface quickly. And a thin, wide biface penetrates those shaggy mammoth hides better and it gets you and your family a delicious rib dinner, garlic mashed potatoes not included. The catch is that it's a very difficult maneuver to be able to pull off on command. Only two cultures identified in the archaeological literature use overshot flaking as a regular manufacturing technique. Those are Salutrian and Clovis, and that's actually a problem for the Salutrian hypothesis. What Stanford and Bradley are arguing is that Salutrian nappers had this overshot-based manufacturing tradition, brought it to America, forgot it for 5,000 years during the pre-Clovis era, and then relearned it just in time to develop the Clovis point. This isn't just the case with overshot flaking. Stanford and Bradley did a statistical analysis called cluster analysis on a range of toolkits from Beringia, Paleo-America, and the European Late Paleolithic. Basically what this does is it sorts a bunch of different sets of data by how similar each set is to all the others. And it looks like this. On this first dendrogram comparing the types of tools in each group, you see that pre-Clovis is most similar to the Beringian Ushki early Juktai cultures, and then those two and Mesa Sluiceway toolkits are more similar to each other than they are to the Nenana toolkits, and so on and so on. Remember that under Stanford and Bradley's hypothesis, we should see a natural step-by-step -step process where Salutrian transforms into pre-Clovis, which then transforms into Clovis. But this analysis shows that pre-Clovis toolkits are closest to all of the Siberian and Beringian toolkits. What about the methods used to make those tools, though? Here's their dendrogram for the technological features, and it's pretty different. Here, fluted Clovis points are much more similar to the late French Salutrian, and then those two pair off with the middle French Salutrian, which goes with North Spanish Salutrian, and then finally pairs with pre-Clovis. 
Meanwhile, at the bottom of the same dendrogram, you see how the pre-Solutrean Gravettian technology and the post-Solutrean Magdalenian pair off, which then pair off with early French Solutrean. What this means is that Clovis and the mid to late French Solutrean are more similar to each other than either is to the technological tradition that came immediately before themselves. This pattern is exactly what convergent evolution looks like. This evidence that in complete defiance of all the odds, people in America retraced the technological steps taken by people in Europe instead of being taught by those Europeans is presented in Stanford and Bradley's own book. What about the other similarities, though? The pebble-paved floors are interesting, but the Solutrians never made them as far as we know. That's a later Magdalenian feature. The caching connection seems compelling until you actually look at the sample sizes and the contents of the caches themselves. David Kilby has a great analysis of this that I'll link in the description. First off, Stanford and Bradley claim that there are many known Solutrian caches, but the reality is that only one has ever been documented the Volgu cache. And this single example is full of laurel leaf bifaces that were completely finished. They were larger than the normal utilitarian versions and were so thin that if anyone ever did use one, it could never be repaired when it broke. Clovis caches are typically the exact opposite. They contain a range of material at various stages of manufacture, and they're all made proportionally so that you can get expedient blades and repairable bifaces for a long time after you start using them. Volgu looks like a symbolic gesture, while the Clovis caches generally look more like supplies that were meant to be recovered and used, either by a living human or by the Anzic child himself in the afterlife. The Kenmar biface is certainly very intriguing, but there's a lot to remember with that story. The biface and the mastodon bones were dredged up by a boat scraping along the ocean floor for shellfish. There's no reason to believe that the biface actually came from the same place as the bones. They could have been from miles apart. The other thing is that Kenmar doesn't really look Solutrian. Solutrian bases are pointed, and Kenmar is deliberately rounded with small finishing flakes along the base. It's also curved in profile which is unlike the Solutrian specimens. There have been other vaguely laurel leaf shaped points found in the same area around the Chesapeake. But here's the thing, the lithic materials around that area are hard to work with, and the easiest shape for a napper to make is the laurel leaf. It's not surprising that a group would come up with that shape independently at all. Honestly, I'm surprised we don't see it more often. We could go on, but I think you get the idea. The Solutrean hypothesis, as fantastic as it sounds, was a really compelling idea that really spurred a lot of good research, and it was based on some legitimate archaeological data and principles. Dennis Stanford was an excellent archaeologist, and Bruce Bradley is still known as one of the most proficient flint nappers out there. These guys had every reason to be confident that they were onto something big. But the work that's been done in the last two decades has not provided new evidence for it, as Stanford and Bradley hoped. And unfortunately, the evidence continues to mount against it, particularly in the realm of genetic research. Of course, we might learn something new in the coming years that makes us reevaluate the situation. But to be perfectly honest, I don't think that's likely. The few genetic analyses we have from the archaic period bodies at Wendover all the way back to the 14,000-year-old human fecal remains from Paisley Caves show that these earliest people were directly ancestral to modern Native Americans with no ties to ancient Europeans. It's shocking that Solutrean nappers devised one of the most elaborate and idiosyncratic tool-making traditions ever seen only to have nappers in America retrace those bizarre steps from a completely different starting point, and then add even more complexity to it. But as of right now, in 2024, that is the most parsimonious explanation to synthesize the huge body of evidence we have in front of us. That's all we have to say about that. I want to thank Ancient Americas for helping me write and research this episode. We're looking forward to reading all of your questions down in the comments section, and until next time, thank you for watching.